possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTE GA podcast. Mikey Stafford and Rory O'Neill here with you, and we are joined joined by Donald O'Cusick to look ahead to the weekend's Allianz League action. How are we doing, lads? Morning, guys. Morning, boys. Ah, it is nice and early, everybody. It's just, it's just after eight AM when we're doing this. We're up, we're up with the lark, and I've got out of the school run for a day. So happy days. Um, so Donald, we have you on. We, we we've decided there's four games that are really of consequence this weekend, as much as league games are of consequence. Dublin v Kilkenny. Cork v Galway, Waterford v Tip, and and Clare v Limerick. So we'll have a look at those in a few minutes. I just wanted to pick your brain on something that uh, Colin Keyes in the Irish Independent had an interview with the um the former Tipperary hurler Connor O'Donovan, who has been banging a drum for a while about the hand pass, which is obviously almost as every spring the hand pass comes comes under the microscope and refs crack down on it a little bit. But Connor O'Donovan's plan is a little bit more extreme than just the referees cracking down on it. Um, he has proposed, and he's he's met the GA Rules Committee on this a few times, that hand passes be allowed, but not from the same hand with which you're holding the ball. So you can either hand pass the ball off the hurl, or you can perform a slight juggling act and throw your hurl into it across to the other hand and hand pass the ball with the hand that was holding your hurl, which is confusing to even say, never mind to do in an inter-county hurling match. I'm wondering, do you think there's any legs in this one? I love seeing lads thinking outside the box and so on, right? And uh, and that's actually a beautiful skill to see a player swapping hands. It's it's actually a hard, hard thing to do. But I would say in terms of the actual game, like if you go back to Gerard McInerney's hand pass last uh, Sunday, and when he was being bottled up by players, when players are tackling like it's a rugby situation, I don't know how you'd actually do that then. You'd want to be some form of a uh, of Houdini to uh, to be able to execute that skill and um like I, I think if the, if it's a throw it's a throw it's as simple as that right but I think that the referees need to err on the side of letting the game flow because players are releasing the ball and they're releasing it very quickly a la that Garrod McInerney um example last Sunday and the, and maybe it colours my view on the whole thing and maybe maybe I haven't let it go yet but I remember the All-Ireland final in 2006 <laughs> the um, Jerry O'Connor gave me a back pass and there was a couple of Kilkenny players coming towards me and obviously you had to release the ball as fast as possible so I released the ball and I hand passed it and Barry Kelly thought I threw the ball I didn't throw the ball at all um, but I definitely think well it's just great to see the people trying to think outside the box and so on I think the actual genesis of what's causing the issue is the way we're tackling and the way players are being held up and that's forcing them then to, to try and come up with different types of hand passes and release the ball. And if we bring a kind of a layer of difficulty in terms of, of executing the hand pass like that, whilst it is a nice skill and whilst it would solve the problem in certain aspects when the player is free and so on, if you had to do like Connor is proposing there, I think when players are battled up, that it it just add to the slowing down of the game, the pulling and the dragging, and so on, which is not hurling in my eyes. Yeah, Rory, you you agree on the the the, the tackling point. So, is that something that needs to needs to be sorry? Excuse the pun. Is that something that needs to be tackled, or is this just something we have to accept that the game's evolving and it will keep evolving and it will go beyond this kind of um you know this kind of hold up tackling. At some point, somebody will will crack it tactically, or is it something the GA have to come in on? Um, yeah, like I would agree with Don Log. I think a big part of the problem is you have players in very tight situations, basically with given no option, but to try and get the ball away quite quickly under a lot of duress. I mean, if you're going to expect a player to be swapping hands, I mean, what's is he going to be allowed to drop the hurley? Has anyone asked Connor that, or does he have? Does he have? Does he have to? It's swap? a ju- ju- juggling act, basically. You've got to, you've got to pop the hurley into one hand and the slitter into the other yeah. at the same time. But look, I mean, yeah, I don't and know then you pull a rabbit a, out of a hat. That, that, that's that's a pretty uh, that's 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 a pretty exacting skill. 
Um, I think ultimately, if that was something like that was to be brought in, you definitely into you're into a situation. Then I say the hand pass has more or less been outlawed. You wouldn't see it that's at all. Maybe I, it, I may, yeah. I may, and maybe that's what he wants. Maybe that's what he wants. But one thing I would say is in relation to last weekend, and Don Logue was on, and we were on, and we were uh, we were. I think if, like, I think if it was, like it was, it's been brought to the referees' attention. I think the referees, by and large, Johnny Murphy, certainly the games we saw, Johnny Murphy, Sean Stack, and um, uh, John Keenan, I think, was the guy in charge in Salt Hill. And I think they got it all pretty much spot on. I think if the referees actually persist with this policy in terms of cracking down on it, I think you will see the skill being executed in the way that it should be. And I don't think it'll be half as much of a problem as people make out. The problem, I suppose, is whether or not referees, one, will persist with this, because as we know, there can be a tendency to sort of fall back into the default position and just let everything go. And number two, it is very difficult for them to actually spot whether there's that little bit of separation when the skill itself is being executed like and they, they can be unsighted they might have a player in their way they might the player itself himself might have his back to him everything at inter-county level as we know is moving 100 miles an hour literally but I think if if we sort of mandate the referees to um to, to to keep up what we saw last weekend as I said from Johnny Murphy Sean Stack and John Keenan, then I don't necessarily see this as being too big a problem. And if the referees, like you said, if the referees pull it right, if when you go down training, right? I'm going down training the club team now tonight. And when we introduce hand passing into the warm up or whatever, you'll see lads throwing the ball and you have to yeah. pull them. And then once you pull them on it, then they start they start hand passing it mm. uh, correctly. But I think you can separate that conversation with the other rules, right? Because they're, they're all linked in, in, in together. The, the ball must be in play to allow players to tackle, right? And if the referees aren't pulling on the steps, what you have is the ball is being taken out of play by players carrying the ball in their hands when they can't be tackled in any other way until the ball is released. So I think it's as important that the referees are watching the steps rule and trying to get the ball back into play to give the tackler the opportunity to do what's in the rules and in dispossess the rules legally. This, to dispossess legally. So that's my point that when you do talk about the hand pass, I do think you have to, to, to bring that into it then because what tends to happen is the player takes the ball out of play, he's carrying the ball, then if you get this pulling and dragging going on, the referees almost feel obliged to nearly give him another couple of steps after yeah, that pulling yeah. and, and dragging ha- happens. So I definitely think you can't have that conversation in isolation without talking about the uh, the other aspects of the game. Hmm. I think that's a fair way of looking at it. Holistically, as we say, this hour in the morning. Um, right, we'll move on to the games. We might we might start in Cusick Park on Sunday because it's, it's always a game that, um, you know, attracts attention, local rivalry, um, balance of power swapping in the last five years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Donald Og, every time we have uh, Dalo on here, um, he takes it as an affront any time Clare are beaten in Cusick Park. Like he, he, he really, he, he definitely more than a lot of teams playing in their home grounds. Dalo tends to kind of, he, I, I get the impression he thinks it's worth five, six, seven points to Clare. Um, I'm wondering, you know, being formally involved over there, what, what you think? Is, is there some logic to what he's saying? Is Cusick Park a major factor for the Clare hurlers? I think Cusick Park is one of those places, you know, there's certain places that you go into in, in Ireland and you feel hurling, right? You feel hurling. And any time I went to Cusick Park, I felt hurling, right? And I was lucky enough to be involved with Clare for two enjoyable years up there. And they love hurling and they love the idea of opposing teams coming to Innes and they're proud of their place and, and, and who they are. So I definitely think there's a, that's a factor. Um, I think people like going there, albeit it might be the easiest place to get in <laughs> and out of, right? But when you're in, there's a real, when there's a crowd, there, there's a really good atmosphere there. You feel as if the crowd, even though the pitch, it's a fine size field, but the people feel as if the crowd feels as if they're in uh, on top of you. Like the, in the, in the, the, the Superstores Munster Cup 
in January, I think there was a sellout of 8,000 people there. You're going to see probably uh, more there this weekend. Um, however, I do think that Limerick, I, I heard John Kiley saying that they want to put in their best performance. And it's hard to see, it's hard to see uh, Limerick not coming away next, next, next weekend without a, a victory there. Right. Uh, Rory, there, there are signs of growth with, with Clare, just to stick with them for a second. Obviously, the, the headlines were grabbed by Tony Kelly scoring 2-12 against Offaly, but, you know, Aaron Shanahar came in, Peter Duggan came in as well, John Conlon played. Like, they're getting they're getting a lot of their, their main pieces back, and um, they obviously, like any team, they look, they look a lot stronger for it, so they could be kind of coming into a bit of form just when they want to be for their neighbours. Uh- they and if you if you look back last weekend as well, it was actually quite tight in um in Offaly right up until half time. I don't know, was it level at half time, nine points apiece? I think it was close but, to level, yeah. Yeah, but they they streaked away in the second half, which would give you an indication either one, obviously the wind or and two, that they're maybe beginning to start to find their groove a small bit. Um they've got uh, as you said, a good few players back now. Um I think from Brian Lawn's perspective, he's one of these old school managers that really places massive store in championship and maybe not so much on the league and will look at the league very much as a place to find a few players, get their fitness levels up to speed and, you know, have a real go at the Munster Championship because look as things stand from this vantage point, if you were ranking the five teams in Munster, the chances are Clare wouldn't be too high on that. Maybe, maybe rank number fifth. So they'll have it all to do. I think they will relish this Sunday. They'll know that there may be an element of vulnerability around Limerick and the fact that you know, look, the, like the, if the two of these teams, like if if they were playing Monopoly, you know. They'd be, you know, they'd be killing each other, like, because just the, just the, the two, the two hurling communities are so intertwined. We saw that recently with Tulla, um, winning the Hearty Cup by beating Art Skullrich in the final, and it just goes all the way down, right up through colleges, the whole way. So there's just, there's a, like, to my mind, it's one of those great rivalries in hurling, probably an underestimated one in a lot of ways. I think, as Don Log said, Cusick Park is. A fantastic place in that it's tight in terms of the actual ground itself. The pitch is massive. That's another. That's one thing that some people tend to forget, like mm. maybe oh, I wouldn't necessarily underestimate. It's called it. a tight ground because it, it's of the, act- the design it, of the stadium. The design the is tight, but the the pitch is actually I think it's certainly up to if not up to Croke Park dimensions. It's not far off, but one forty five by ninety. But. Uh, I'd expect eight or nine, ten thousand there on Sunday. Really raucous atmosphere, but I just sense that Limerick's greed, Limerick's need will be greater. In that, I wouldn't be surprised if we see maybe twelve, thirteen. But we won't see Seamus Flanagan, and um, uh, we won't we won't see him now for the rest of the league because he's actually got a two match ban as a result of two sendings off within a twelve month period. But you, I think you'll probably see close enough. We haven't seen the teams yet because obviously they don't get released until tonight, tomorrow. But I wouldn't be surprised if you see Limerick to 12, 13 of their championship team because they know, look, with all due respect, their last match is awfully. So in terms of a tune-up, this is probably their best chance before facing Cork and Fo in, in seven weeks' time. Yeah, it's it's not a... a it's, I don't think Donald by any means it's a dangerous game to play. And I think suggestions that they've kind of throw in the league to have a longer break are a bit mischievous but like there's there's no doubt John Kiley is not overly exercised by three defeats so far he's probably not happy about it but I'd say more so than anything probably he's not happy with the fact that the lads who have come in to kind of fill the gaps left by the established players who won the last two All-Irelands perhaps you know outside of um, Cahill Shane Cahill is outside of him perhaps they ha- they're, they're not up to the same standard which I suppose in one way isn't a surprise because the team that won the last two All-Irelands have been breathtaking so you can't expect lads to come in from under 20 and hit the ground running but at the same time like John Kiley wasn't planning to lose these three games so perhaps he was a little bit surprised he has to be a little bit surprised by the level of performance he's had like with every team right that goes on a winning streak and you see this with the Dublin footballers saw it with Kate Kinney you see it with Limerick you, you kind of hear this story that 
to, they could put out a second team that are, <laughs> are strong. Yeah. And in any sport, have you ever seen that as being the case? Have you ever seen the case where number 23 is as good as number eight, eight and nine? And there's no way Limerick have went out to win the league or to be winning, went all out to win those games because if they did, they wouldn't be leaving the likes of Dermot Burns, Aaron Gillan, Willow Donahue, and those guys off and not starting them, right? Um, but I think the whole challenge in the league is for every every management. It's like a judgment call. You sit down to start of the year and you say, right, do we need to give certain fellas more time than others? Do we need to bring some young lads into the panel and give them experience? Are we going to mind maybe some of the older players? But the biggest challenge everybody has is peaking, right? It's one of the, from a, a personal level, from a sports point of view, and then from teams, it's to get teams to peak when you want them to peak is the biggest challenge. And I think it's very interesting watching Limerick this year with that in mind because Rory touched on it like you've got this weekend now they're they're, they're away at the Clare really good game um, for, for, for them right with all due respect if Offaly then on the 20th of March and then potentially they don't play another game until the 17th of April mm-hmm. now that's a fair distance away to manage your training and they're start- mathematically out of the league now so they are they no, will be finished gone, yeah. they're finished after the Offaly game yeah so like that's and they have sat down at the start of the year and said right they're obviously backing themselves again in terms of their ability to actually do the right preparation and make sure that they're they're hitting the ground running against against Cork down in Parky Key which is going to be a huge game, but it's a gamble. It's it, but it's the whole. It's for every manager. That's what they're doing, Rory. It's mm-hmm. a gamble. It's judgment. They're trying to to balance all of these things because just picture this. If Limerick went down to Cork then, right, and didn't get a result, which is a possibility, right, that it, that for, for Cork to win, then in the next round, they're at home to Warford. You could say they're playing in their first two championship games, they're playing the two closest contenders that they have, right? Like Warford. Tough start. Tough start going to Limerick. That's going to be a... You, you wouldn't say that's a foregone conclusion by any manner or means. We know last year, last year's result in, in, in the championship that there was a, a gap between them and it will be a job for Warford to close that gap. But it's still uh, a tough uh, game. And their third game is a weird way to clear. And we just spoke about the, the Cusick Park um, aspect of it. So like it's it'll be very interesting to watch. And they have a new strength and conditioning coach as well, I believe, and strength and conditioning coach and that whole athletic development aspect of uh, of an organization is a critical um uh, person in the group it'll be just very interesting to watch um but again last year they were in more or less the, uh, the exact same position in terms of going into the fourth game looking for their first victory yeah yeah they, it, it, there's there's a sense of deja vu deja vu sorry Cahill O'Neill is the, the name of the guy I was trying to think mm. of there who has who has been very impressed with Rory um Don Logue, I think you, you were you, you were predicting uh, a Limerick win this weekend. How do you see it going, Roy? Yeah, I think Limerick's need will be greater, and I think they'll they'll want to <clears throat> they want to sign off without again, I suppose, looking ahead to looking ahead to the Offaly game. But they'll 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 want some class of a of a of a marquee victory on their belt. I think before heading into Championship, because I think it'll probably help remove. Um, get confidence flowing again and um, I think look they'll as I said the rivalry that they have with their neighbours I think that will be something that will give them a bit of a boost as they head into championship preparation so just Limerick by a couple of points Okay Um, we'll stick with that we'll stick with that group then and Cork and Galway uh, Don Logue, I'm 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 conscious that we've got I've got two Corkmen on this podcast with a Wexford man. I'm very very self satisfied from a, a league standings point of view at this stage. Not that not that anybody's handing out bouquets at this time of the year, but um, uh, there was a lot to admire in that Cork victory the other day. You know, started like from a mentality point of view, going up against a team that kind of did what they did to in the All Ireland final from a physical point of view, which has obviously been well talked about, and then. Just from a hurling point of view, the mix of forwards, you know, that they have, the fact that the defence looks a hell of a lot more solid than it has for the last couple of years. Um, they look in good order, and the beauty of the league is, depending on how seriously the other team are taking it, you are getting you're getting tested against teams that you know 
but they won't face him in the in the Munster Championship. But Galway are probably seen as a top three, top four team with a very you know interesting, motivated new manager. So um, this is another very good test for them. They're at home again, and Galway will be. You'd have to think be a little bit motivated after the the nature of their own defeat last weekend. Definitely, Mikey. Really looking forward to that game on Saturday night. You, you mentioned last weekend. It was definitely a step forward for Cork, right? It was very important after the All Ireland final last year that Cork came out and, and did what they did. And I thought what was really impressive was you can see Cork are moving the ball well. Like they've got that nice mixture of kind of really good intelligent spatial awareness moving it through that that middle part of the field, and they mixed it up as well. Like there was a lot, a lot of other good aspects to the uh, to the game. But when I saw that team na- being named by John Coyley, I my feeling was he was almost putting Cork in a no-win position. That that would that was my gut. And in reality, you'd have to say Cork should be beating that team that Limerick put out in the first half if they do have designs in the All Ireland Championship, which they do. So they should be beating that team and beating them uh, beating them well. And it's worth saying as well. That when when Limerick did bring on, we'll say more the recognised players, even though the game was over, the contest w- w- was over at at half time. Um, Limerick won the second half, I think, one eight to six points. So that's not going to be lost on Cork either. But like I said, it was definitely a, a step forward and a very uh, positive step forward. Galway, Galway bring uh, a really good challenge as well on Saturday night uh, before last weekend. You, we maybe kind of had Galway as on, on a higher uh, ranking than we than we do this week, um, but still they're one of those top teams. Um, they they'll be disappointed with last Sunday. I I I thought that they were I thought they were unremarkable to be honest in 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 many aspects. I was at the game down in the Gaelic grounds and it was it was a fierce game for this time of year. Fierce, mm. right and. Uh, I've said it many times that the, you want to be a mighty, mighty person out to play in the county hurling, and that was a reminder of it, of, of, of it that night. But my sense the way that game was going that night was it was heading for a draw, right? And Garrod Hegarty getting getting sent off. Will O'Donoghue gone early in the game? I think that was um, an, an advantage to uh, to Galway, but it's 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 a good and they'll want Galway will want the performance on Saturday night. Yeah, getting Connor Whelan back is is a major thing for Galway, isn't it, Rory? We we yeah, yeah. we don't know. It was it was just a, a slight knock in training, said Shefflin. So he said he doesn't expect him to be out for long, but he won't be risking him either. But he not just from a scoring point of view, but just from kind of uh, being a focal point for that attack, he's he's just vitally important, isn't he? He he, oh, he is, and I think it's a very good point in that. I think what he will also do is he will pose questions for a position in the Cork team that I think is still very much undecided or like I, like he's he's going to play the edge of the square full forward and he'll drift out like he, I mean he kind of he he reminds me he's like a bull you know who just roams this kind of field and like it's very he's incredibly hard to tame He's got massive shoulders on him. Win it up high. He can win it down low. He can take his own score. He can create. I'd say he's a nightmare. A nightmare to mark now. Um, I, I could only imagine now what it's like to try and handle him. So I, I'd be very, very interested to see, number one, what Cork do in terms of um, man, man mark and detail. And number two, how, like, there's your help. Def- there's obviously your, your man-to-man defence. But then there's your health defence as well, um, which we see a lot in Gaelic football. We see coming into hurling a lot more now as well in that you have, um, it's not just about one guy being left on his own, especially when you're trying to deal with somebody like Conor Whelan. So I think the challenge that he's going to pose, we've seen Robert Downey at full back moved back out to the wing. Um, Jerm Mellerick played a little bit in there. Um, it was changed up again the last day. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what, what back six he goes with and whether or not they're able to contain him. My, the, th- the one aspect, and I know people often say it's not as much of an issue in inter-county hurling because the ball moves so quick, but pace is an important aspect and Parky Cueve is such a fantastic pitch. I think that's the one area where I think Galway struggled. They struggled against Wexford, 
last Sunday. Now, obviously, the team would be a lot different this this Saturday night below 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 Park below Park Creek, but um, like there's so much pace all over the Cork team, like fr- from defence right through to attack, and um, I think that could be an area where uh, Galway might actually struggle at times to live with Cork, especially seeing as they're going so well at this time of the year, which is very untypical, by the way, for Cork to take the league and winter hurling seriously at all. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen this before. This is brand new. Like, it's weird. <laughs> yeah, you say that, but like, I'm yeah. still scarred by the memories of those three league finals where you eventually bet us uh, back in, what was it, yeah. 91 or 92 because of extra good. I think Don Logue, Don Logue, Don Logue, it might have been Don Logue. Was it your first year or second year on the panel? The last time that Cork won the league, isn't it? 98. Is that Was that your first year on the panel? Was my first year, no, but it was a sub to Jordan Cunningham in 1998. Yeah, and I tell you, it did Cork no harm at all. The mm. uh, like it was a good run. Jimmy was in charge, he was after coming in after the uh, after the minors. And even though Cork went down, Cork had beaten Clare in the semi final of the league that year, beat Watford. It must have been 40,000 people at least down in uh, Torres for that league final. But anyway, lovely summer's day. Sean O'Farrell got a great goal for Cork. Dean Sullivan was captain. Um, but the Clare beat Cork well subsequently in the championship, but Cork went down and won the All Ireland the year after. And I do think winning the league was a was a good, very good aspect and, and and fit into that. So, but I think Cork are, I think winning the league would do Cork no harm at all. Why would yeah. why would it do Cork any harm? Why would it do Cork any harm to have big games in the lead up to the uh, to the to the championship? Like the only downside of it would be that you'd be showing your hand fully to Limerick, right? And Limerick would be able to see what you're at because it'd be hard not to, if you did get to a league semi-final and final and not, not to show uh, a lot of your hand. But in terms of getting, I think when you're sitting down to get a team ready, like we said previously, trying to organise good games. And no matter what you say, you're going to say, right, lads, we've got an A versus a B game now uh, next week. And we know we need to make that like a championship game. But in reality... It's not. The closest mm. thing you're going to get to a championship game is if you were playing one a of league the league semi-final, league final. Yeah. Exactly, when there is something on the line. So I think it's in, it's in Cork's interest to drive on and go as far as they can in the league. Um, I, I was interested, it uh, might be something we come back to talk to specific, specifically about Cork and Wexford another day, just about the way they're kind of they're mixing their play. And it just brings me on to Dublin and Kilkenny, who seem to me, they may be two teams who are a little bit more, and maybe unfair, but resolutely kind of sticking to kind of a more, um, a, a, a more, a more traditional game plan, which is certainly working for them. I, I'd be, I've just been, I've just noticed how physical Dublin have been this year. And as we were discussing um, here last week, is that like with, um, sorry, on Monday, um, they need to be, they need to be physical. They need to be settled at this stage, Donald, because we're into year four of the Matty Kenny project. And in fairness to him, he has most of his best players fit and firing. Like Owen O'Donnell being fit on the edge of the square is worth a hell of a lot to Dublin. Anybody would say he's one of the best fullbacks in the country. But they just seem yes. a very, very solid team now, which is has been, shall we say, Kilkenny's calling card for as long as Brian Cody has been there. So I'm very interested in this game because it's one... That actually, on paper, you'd almost be expecting Dublin to win when you look at the form lines this spring. And they're at home in Parnell Park as well. Sorry, 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 don't look. All right, Rory, try on by. The, uh, but uh, what I was what I was going to say there was what you were saying about the team, Mikey, right? And um, and like Matty, and a great time for 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 Matty. I worked with him on a, a project and got to know him a bit a number of years ago on a, a Super Elevens project. Highly organised, really loves loves his hurling, and um, very extremely capable. So. I wasn't surprised to see what he did with Kula. Um, and I'm not surprised. I, I definitely think you're, you're seeing improvement in the Dublin team. And I was down in Turles last Saturday night. And I know we mentioned it previously, given the, the maybe the craziness of demands of supporters and stuff like that, that if if Matty didn't win silver this year, you would hear uh, calls for, for, for change. But I don't think it's beyond Dublin's grasp at all. And I really like the, you referred to it there, there's a really good spine in the team. Like if you look at Owen O'Donnell at fullback, top class. I liked Petty Smith at centre back. Mm. I think the modern day centre back, you need to be agile. You need to be able to. You mentioned support defence there. You need to be able to get in and support, and almost be able to play like a cornerback in certain situations, and then like a quarterback in other aspects. And I liked. I just liked the way he he played last week. Then 
If you look in the middle of the field, you have Burke and Crummy. Mm. And in terms of the forwards, I've been critical of Dublin over the last number of years that that was that that was really where they needed to improve. But there was a good feeling about him in in in, in Turles last Sunday. Denny Sutcliffe, I spoke about him last Sunday night. I thought he was very good. Worked really hard. I love the way he's got an uncanny way of catching the ball off off both hands for puckouts. I thought he was really intelligent and he worked really well with the inside line of Mellet and Whiteley and their movement. It's so important that your inside line are continuously moving and creating space. But when they're doing that, you need intelligent players outside that are able to, to pick them out. And I thought Sutcliffe was an example of that. And the last person I'll mention is, is Hayes. Yeah. I think if Hayes can bring the type of form we saw in the club, if he can bring that to the inter-county level, I actually think that could be a game changer for Dublin. Yeah, they they do. They look, as I say, Rory, they look really settled, whereas Kilkenny are a team who are, you know, crying out to get their Ballyhale contingent back, which is, you know, I I know we have to get used to the fact that Kilkenny, you know, Leinster champions and all that they are. They're, They're not the force they were previously, but at the same time, it's still unusual for... As I know they're one of the best club teams of all time, but it, it is amazing that they are so reliant on the members of one club team. To me, that still seems strange, but it's also, it's undeniable that the difference that they'll make when they come in. Um, we should, we're not promoting gambling here. In fact, the, quite the opposite. But I was just out of curiosity having a look <clears throat> the, uh, the other day just to see what the odds were. Kilkenny are 14 to 1 to win the All-Ireland. Now, it's a long, long time, long time since I've seen odds like that for Kilkenny to win the All-Ireland. And it'll give you an indication, I suppose, of their standing. Um, they're still, I suppose, like they're trying to find a couple of players the same as everybody else. I think t- to a certain extent, I think they were lucky that they were in, 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 in the same group as Leash and... Off, as Leash and um, Antrim. Leash and Antrim. So, uh, because I think they might have actually struggled quite a bit had they been in the other group. Like, th- the reality is, they, they were never going to be, like, but what, what people sometimes tend to forget about Kilkenny is, is how small a county it is. There's only something like six, seventy, eighty, seventy-eight, 80, 78 or 80, 78 or 79,000 people living in the whole county. It's tiny. I mean, it is so, so small. They've only got about 20 clubs. So for them to actually achieve the kind of levels of success, now obviously they're hurling only, but like for them to achieve the levels of success that they did for that decade, it was remarkable. It was never going to be sustainable in, a, in the frightening way that Dublin's looked to be in football. So they're in a bit of a lull. They're looking around for a few players. They will do what Kilkenny always do, which is a hallmark of every team that I'm sure Don Lowe can attest to, which is go down fighting, but they just don't have the quality that they once had. And like, if they're going to be still dependent on a 35 year old uh, TJ Reed, you know, maybe Richie Hogan coming off the bench to try and, you know, spearhead their challenge, then you would be a little bit worried for them. Having said that, um, I think they will, no doubt rise to the challenge of taking Dublin on. They seem to enjoy Parnell Park. They've had a couple of big wins there down through the years. But I think from Dublin's point of view, no different to last Saturday night in Thurles, that if Dublin are really serious now, if this is Dublin kind of peaking under Matty Kenny, if this is the Dublin team reaching a level of maturity in terms of their age profile, in terms of their conditioning work, in terms of having a settled team, in terms of um, you know, quite experienced now from club all the ways through, then Dublin really need to be doing the business on Saturday night on, in a game that's live on TV. Yeah, Jeez, don't know. For the Kilkenny fans, please don't be the second Corkman on this podcast to sympathise with Kilkenny's plight. I don't, I don't think they can handle it. And I, also I wouldn't be think, feeling too sorry for them now. Well, okay. <laughs> but then you might be slipping towards patronising, which would be worse for them. Um, no, no. Um, yes, no. But like at the same time, don't know. You bring back Joey Holden and Richie Reed, and I know T.J. Reed, obviously Owen Cody, Adrian Mullen, obviously Colin Fenley isn't coming back. Like that's four or five fairly significant players to come back into that team. Um, you know, so uh, we might want to be writing their epitaphs just yet. 
definitely wouldn't do do that, Mikey. And uh, like I know TJ is thirty five, but he didn't play like it. <laughs> like what a player was it? Was yeah. there in terms of when you're talking about the greats, like the greats of the the game? And I had this conversation with a couple of clients that's there a couple of weeks ago, and it was it was after the semi final of the club championship down the field, and obviously all the, the heroics there and so on. But like you bring all the other players you mentioned and TJ Reid back into that because he's a great man to look after himself, right? It's not like mm-hmm. maybe with all due respect to ourselves in uh, a couple of years ago when you were heading towards 35, everybody was saying, geez, you were, you were on borrowed time. But for a player like TJ who looks after himself so well and all those other players, like is there any championship game that you're going to go into this year that Kilkenny will be playing <clears throat> against anybody where you'd write off their chances? I don't think so. No, absolutely not. And it's in, you, you say he's looking after himself. It's interesting as well that there doesn't seem to be any suggestion from Brian Cody to kind of bring those Ballyhale lads back last week, etc. Now, maybe it was the leash game. He wouldn't have felt a need. But you'd imagine even if they were playing a fierce rival, Brian Cody wouldn't feel a need to rush those lads back because particularly TJ, because he knows how much he'll need him in a month and a half time so don't be let him have a couple of weeks between club and county it'll i guess the logic is it'll pay off come championship it's an interesting one i wonder if 10 years ago would, would it be the same situation i wonder right and mm. uh again I, I had that conversation with, with somebody yesterday and we were we were posing that question but in terms of player management let the players off they're like the, the, the year is long enough now the year especially for successful club teams and players involved in that so the year is, is turning out that it's 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 never ending for them so like teachers out there in, in in the sun having a having a break after a long club season that only doing good yeah yeah um okay so how do we see that one going lads do we see it's 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 a close one so i'd be interested to see how do you how don log who do you think is going to win it i'm going to go with dublin mm-hmm. slightly with dublin okay uh, rory likewise yeah i just think they have yeah yeah i think dublin at home, Parnell, I think there's just probably a little bit better momentum with them. Yeah, Dublin by a couple of points again. In a good game too, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, and as always, the Wexford man Stockholm syndrome in me will say, I can't ever back against Kilkenny. It'll be a long time before I'm able to back against Kilkenny. It's not an unreasonable point. To, to I'm like a whipped, I'm a whipped car at this stage. I can't, I can't look any other way. Um, so finally then, lads, we'll finish up soon enough. It, it's an interesting one. It's the... Um, what I like to call Don Log the, the Liam Cahill uh Derby, uh the sliding doors game, what might have been, etc. Um Colin Bonner hasn't had the easiest of uh, of starts to his uh temporary um term, most of it completely out of his doing. I was interested we had Liam Sheedy on here last week and like he you know, he said it is tough and he said the the, the problem for Colin Bonner is he's trying to blood new players, which is something Liam Sheedy did very sparingly over the last couple of years. He's trying to blood new players and implement a new style of play and he says that's just that's just really hard to do both those things in competitive matches it's you know kind of double jeopardy I, going back to the game on saturday night with tip right which is the, the a tip against dublin you could see that was apparent Um the like seamus Callan was maybe the high you know a lot of talk coming into the game that he was back I wasn't surprised that he I wasn't surprised that he wasn't maybe as sharp as some people would have would have liked. And I wasn't surprised to see him going off after 55 minutes. Like if you would have, if you would have fully fit Seamus Cannon and going up against uh, an Owen O'Donnell, you really go and pay for that. <laughs> yeah, he sure would. Gone at it th- th- themselves. And it was interesting though, Cannon did get a first. He got the first bite of the cherry a couple of times. That if he was sharp, sharper, he could have made a difference. The tip. They're going through transition, if not transformation, right? I don't think it's it's transformation. The they need the likes of Jake Morris definitely seems as if he's stepping up to the mark, but they'll need him. They'll need him to become a, a Canon type warrior over the next couple of years. They when the McGraths came on, there was a different feel to the game. You could see the class that they brought to it, but the McGraths are like they're not going to be around for forever either. And it doesn't you, you it's not apparent who are the next types of McGraths that are, that are that are coming along. And I think we praised the Dublin full forward line and I think they were excellent. But I think you, you we saw as well the Tipperary were missing Kyle Barrett. So they're gonna need all of those players back and fit and healthy 
um, and I'm still not sure they're going to have enough to going to have enough this year to make a, a significant impact, Mikey. Yeah, it's noticeable, Roy, that you know they're blood and new players. They're kind of trying to you know kind of build a squad. He only brought on three subs. You know the two McGraths and Connor Bow. They were the only substitutions against Dublin. So that could be telling in itself that you if you if you want to build a squad, you think even in a tight game you'd be using your full allocation of of subs in the league. He seems to be betwixt and between in goal as well, which doesn't help. I think your goalkeeper now as well is so, so important. You know, he's kind of, uh, he's flicking between the two Hogan's Brian and Barry. Um, both midfielders taken off. Not not usually a good sign the last day. Um, particularly Paddy Cadell. Jeez, I, I, I watch a bit of Fitzgibbon and I saw him with UCC a couple of years ago when, when they won the Fitzgibbon over in... Um, the match was played over in DCU. They beat DJ Carey's Carloway team in the final. Um, Dara Fitzgibbon and Shane Kingston were playing and Nilo Leary were playing for UCC the same night. And Paddy, Gade- Paddy Cadell, I mean, Paddy Cadell was, to my mind, was the best player in the field. And f- for some reason, he ju- like he, uh, he was a much heralded underage player. Obviously, very good Fitzgibbon pedigree, which is normally a good sign. For some reason, it hasn't seen, it hasn't just happened for him yet. For a fellow that I think has got bags of ability, I think he's a natural successor in there in terms of leadership and everything else. So, um, look, she's still very young and there's plenty of time, but yeah, I think he's he's in terms of this team selection the last day, like Colum obviously said, Look, I'm gonna go with this and I'm just gonna leave these lads out there and let's sink or swim and see how they get on. Um, we know that he's lost a couple of a big leaders. I think the issue for them this weekend is having lost at home to Dublin, I think, for the first time since pre-World War II era, <laughs> era. You know, it's not getting any easier to have to go down to Walsh Park to face a watch for team buyed up by a recent All-Ireland club success. And they've tied the Burka back in the mix They've obviously got a little bit of the Indian sign over them. They knocked them out of the championship last year. We could see uh, the Bally Gunner lads as well, you think. Could see the Bally Gunner lads back. You might even have the Bally Gunner um team paraded at half time, you know, with the cup and all of that. And there'll be a massive crowd. Obviously, it's got that derby feel. And the other factor that throw, that's thrown into the mix is this is the very first championship match as well as in the very first day of the Sunday game live on the 17th of April at two o'clock, it's going to be Wad for tip followed by Cork Limerick. So there's a whole pile of subplots going on here. No, no less than Liam Cahill's involvement. And it's going to make for very, very interesting and a very interesting afternoon from both teams. And one I'm really looking forward to actually. Yeah. Um, Donald, uh, on, on Waterford, um, They've been they've been involved in some like you say you know the league you know can be a little bit half hearted or maybe you know teams are experimenting. Everyone in Watford's game so far seem to be in like a bit of a clinker and a bit like high, they're very high scoring. I was saying here on Monday, um, they're a wonderfully physical team. They all, they have been for years, but like they they seem to be happy to to hurley off the field or you know manhandly off the field and um. I was, like they they've got they seem to just have an abundance of forwards now. They've got. A very wide variety of defenders because because they've had to because they've had so many injuries over the last few years that people have had to step up um it seems like three or four lads have had to play center center half back at times and now they have all these guys back and can kind of spread them across the defense they just like I, i'm i'm throwing bouquets at them here but they just like they just seem to be building into a very kind of complete team and they've had to go through a couple of years of troubles to do that because you know, needs must. And when you lose some of your key players, others have to step up. And now, fingers crossed for them, they keep everybody fit. They look, they just look like a very, very, you know, packed team and squad. Building that feel, manager, that's that's obviously there's a, a good chemistry going on there. You need all those things coming together, Mikey, to, uh, for a successful operation. I think they scored 229 last year. Against against Tipperary in in this fixture, I think the belly gunner is a the belly gunner victory is a big boost to Waterford psychologically, right? It's uh, if if 
if Belly Gunner went out against Belly Hale and lost by a couple of points in the final, there would have been a feeling of, oh my God. Here we go again. We yeah. we got so close, but we never came home with the with, with the cup. But I, I think psychologically that's going to be a huge boost. All of those players coming back in with that with that medal on their chest, and that's a, a serious medal. Big gathering in, in Walsh Park on Sunday. That being the that being the the championship game that's coming up, I think that's a great game to, to look forward. I mentioned hurling places and going into hurling places and a, a feeling of hurling in the Lake Sikusi Park. Welsh Park is, is another one of those when it's full, when there's a war for crow there with hope in their hearts, and there be no small rivalry between themselves and Tipperary down through the year. So that's a great game to look forward to. Mag- magic games. I don't think I don't like the game is infinitely better. Uh, no, no, than it has been over. Even when I compare it to twenty years ago, I think the game is in a great state. And even if you look at all the games that we've had, the quality of the hurling, the quality of the players, the games we are talking about here in terms of the excitement that's building, and then that building into the the round robin and the championship, I think that there's loads to look forward to for hurling people. Yeah, and are we all seeing a Watford win in this game? Definitely for me, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I think they just there's just uh, again just uh, I mean I was just looking at their full back line there. Erla Daly, Connor Prunty, and Connor Gleeson. I mean that's a, that's it. Like people are talking about their forwards and the Aust- the Austin Gleesons and you know mm. the Shane Bennetts and all of that. Like they're defensively. I mean they're, they're they, these guys are mean enough back there as well. And yeah, um, yeah I think Waterford Waterford hurling is in a good place and. So they go here. The daily is he was centre half back last year. Now he's corner back. You know, like yeah, these lads yeah. are kind of getting they're getting yeah. the experience across the well, line. Tyke, you've you've tied the Burka back. Like I mean, and I think Jamie Barron possibly is on his way back to full fitness. I mean, he hasn't featured in the league yet. I mean, what a player to introduce! Like, like about Juricel bunnies, you know. And uh, oh, listen, I think they're in a good place. It's going to be uh, it could be very very uh, very interesting year for Watford hurling. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, lads. Uh, just to mention, we've got a double header on TV on Saturday, don't we, Rory? Unusual. Double header on on the air at half four, five o'clock throw in Dublin, Kilkenny, and then presentation is from Parky Cueve Cork. Hopefully, the weather holds off, and it is meant to be good. Cork versus Galway at seven under lights, under the LED lights, which would be you know because I know it's actually an interesting one. Hurlers don't generally like playing under lights, don't log. Would that be fair? The, there's a great atmosphere in the night games, right? That's what I would mm. say. There is always a danger that the ball, when it goes into the light, like the, the, the toughest opponent when you're on the field as a goalkeeper, I always said, was the sun, right? Because if the ball goes into the sun, you're in big trouble. You just can't, you can't see it. But not far off of that then is the light. So it does, it does, the ball can get lost in the lights. But I tell you, for me, that used to be compensated by, I, I used to love the atmosphere. The atmosphere, yeah. yeah. I, I, I used to love it. There was something, something special about it. Mm, there'll be a good crowd down, and there'll be a good crowd down there. You'd expect 14,000, 15,000 in Parky Cueve on Saturday night as well now. So, yeah, so loads of hurling this weekend to look forward to. Really look forward to it. Yeah, and obviously you can keep across games on Saturday and Sunday Sport on RT Radio 1. And we'll have live blogs and reports and all the rest reaction on the RT website and the news app. So thank you, Donald, and thank you, Rory, and we'll be back on Monday to review the games. See you then. Good boys. Crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar.